Good morning, and welcome to St. Luke's Lutheran Church online service for August 14th, 2022. My name is Dennis Faust. I will be the lay leader this morning. Before we start our service, I have a few brief announcements. So we are open for in-person worship. We have a service at 8 a.m. this Sunday being led by Pastor Barb Pence from Peace and Zion UCC. So uh, we love to see your face sitting in the pews for that service. Uh, Montgomery County remains at a uh, COVID level of medium. Uh, so based on the uh, church council policy, uh, masks are recommended for all indoor activities. Uh, the call committee update is that we don't have a call committee update from last week. Uh, the Conference of Deans will be meeting this coming Thursday, and hopefully we will get a, a candidate or two out of that. Uh, also, a week from Tuesday, Pastor Chris McKinstry, who was the Upper Montgomery Parish Dean on the Board of Deans, will be meeting with Church Council and the call committee to review where we stand. The next community dinner is this Thursday, August 18th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, the line forms early outside of the fellowship hall. It is takeout only still. Uh, what we're doing is we're limiting you to four dinners per car until everyone in the line has been serviced. And if we have any extras, we'll be glad to help you out with whatever else you would like. Uh, the dinners this month, the dinner this month is Sloppy Joe Sandwich, Baked Beans, Coleslaw, with a Lemon Pound Cake for dessert. So hopefully we will see you in the line. Uh, the St. Luke's Golf Outing will be on September 9th. If you'd like to participate in it or if you would like to help out uh, behind the scenes that day, please reach out to Brendan Greer or Rob Bickelman and uh, we can help you out with, they can help you out with that. Uh, the fall church schedule and the Sunday school year starts on September 11th. That's just around the corner. Uh, there'll be lots of special festivities that day, including a church picnic after the 10, 15 a.m. service. Uh, so that Sunday, we will have an 8 a.m. communion service, a 10, 15 traditional service. And that will be our schedule going forward through the remaining, remainder of the year, we hope. And then once we get a cold pastor, who knows what we're going to do. Anyway, the church picnic, which is going to be after the second service, uh, we'll have the traditional picnic foods, there'll be games, uh, there will be a softball game, and we will officially dedicate the, uh, the softball field. Back when I was council president several years ago, just before COVID started, uh, we renamed the field the Rocky Alderfer uh, Memorial Softball Field and we will have a little dedication ceremony before the church softball game that day. So, uh, you know, reach out to uh, Irene Sassman or Candace Love for uh, anything about that. And if there are any, if anyone in the congregation has any pastoral needs during this time of transition, please reach out to Marty Jordan and he can get you the resources you need. With that, let us begin with the order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, beloved children of God, grace, mercy, and peace be with you all. 
and also with you. Let us pray. O God, judge eternal, you love justice and hate oppression, and you call us to share your zeal for truth. Give us courage to take our stand with all victims of bloodshed and greed, and following your servants and prophets, to look to the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah, beginning at the 23rd verse. Am I a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back? Those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Here ends the first reading. Our psalm is Psalm 82. God, stand to charge the divine council assembled. Give judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favor to the wicked? Save the weak and the orphan. Defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They do not know, neither do they understand. They wander about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. The second reading is from the 11th chapter of Hebrews, beginning at the 29th verse. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, <clears throat> put foreign armies to fight, Women received their release. I'm sorry, women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order, or suffering others, let me try that again. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death they were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, 
since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and he has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Here ends the second reading. The Holy Gospel lesson for today is from the 12th chapter of Luke, beginning at the 49th verse. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it was already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Those were some readings, huh? So, as I was looking over uh, today's gospel, something occurred to me. One of my favorite television shows of all time is The West Wing. And uh, the White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Joshua Lineman, uh, in an episode was shot in an assassination attempt on the president. He almost dies, and it takes him months to recover and fully get back to work. But one day, not too long after he goes back to work, Josh snaps out, loses his temper in the Oval Office and starts shouting at the president. His co-workers and the president are shocked because that was so out of character for the way Josh normally acted. It was shrill and just out of control. In fact, as we later learn, it was out of character and it was totally out of control because Josh was suffering from post-traumatic post stress syndrome from the being shot. That, and it just kicked in at the sound of a cello. <laughs> so I started to wonder if maybe some of the people around Jesus, the day of the, the, our gospel reading, might have thought that something was seriously wrong with Jesus. I mean, Jesus seems to lose it here a bit, going on a bit of a verbal tirade. Jesus lets the folks around him know, in no uncertain terms, what's on his mind, and what's on his mind is pretty white hot. And it, it's quite a conclusion for this chapter of Luke. For the past few weeks, we've been going through Luke 12, and we've had multiple themes as we've been going through it. A lot of imagery, uh, some, uh, a parable was thrown in, a lot of kind words about not worrying about our lives and a smattering of other things. Like I said, we've spent the last three weeks going through it all. And today we come to the end of Luke 12. And boy, does Luke 12 end with a bang. Jesus here spouts all kinds of things that could get a person labeled a lunatic, both in the first century of Israel and in the 21st century here. So what prompted Jesus to do this? It's probably difficult to know exactly what prompted it, but from the looks of the passage, it appeared that just maybe there were some who were trying to 
make nice by tamping down all the possible controversy surrounding Jesus, his message, and the kingdom he was proclaiming. And make no mistake, what Jesus was saying to them and to us today was really controversial. Maybe there were some who were seeing the stir Jesus was causing with the religious establishment of the day and who were saying to him, can't we all just get along? Like the old saying from the song, come on people now, smile on your brother, everybody get together, gotta love some, everybody right now. You know, just let's go along to get along, live and let live. We all agree on more than, we, we agree more than we disagree. We're all on the same team, so let's all pull together. Pharisees, Sadducees, chief priests, Jesus, Jesus' disciples. Let's all start rowing, rowing our oars in the same direction, right? Well, maybe. In any event, there obviously had been some talk about how Jesus should make things nice and smoother because from the looks of the verses, Jesus was speaking out about what he thought to be a false impression of who he was and what his ministry was about. Jesus didn't come to prop up the old ways. Jesus didn't come to perpetuate more of the same. His kingdom doesn't fit neatly with the kingdoms of this world. And so a strong measure of disruption was to be expected and was probably essential for what Jesus was here to accomplish. Apparently, then as in now, it was easy to turn Jesus into a kind of Rorschach inkblot test where you could see whatever you wanted to see in Jesus. And people would think that no one perception is any better than another. Some, some people still talk about Jesus in those kinds of terms today. They think that Jesus is here to validate the best and brightest of whoever you are and whatever you want. They think that following Jesus is mostly just about being nice, about getting along, and about endorsing any and every viewpoint. And I think to this, Jesus says a very firm, nope. To think of Jesus that way is to misunderstand him and his kingdom. To make the point, Jesus invokes some meteorological imagery to remind people that they're better at reading the weather than they are spiritual signs. When the wind turns southerly or a dark cloud appears on the western horizon, the folks in first century Israel knew what that meant. But now that the kingdom of God appears on the horizon of their spiritual awareness, they clearly have no clue what that kingdom means. They think it means more of the same, the old time religion warmed over. But in fact, the kingdom Jesus was bringing represents this earthly world inverted, then and inverted now. This is the point Luke has been making from the get-go in his gospel. Anyone who thinks Jesus is coming to represent the same old, same old, just needs to read Mary's Magnificat back in Luke 1. Mary fore foresaw with amazing clarity the reversal of the way things normally go, with the poor getting elevated and the rich getting sent away empty-handed. Anyone who saw the kingdom of God as representing business as usual was misreading the signs just as surely as someone who saw a dark cloud and predicted sunshine or someone who grabbed a parka because they felt a strong southerly breeze. Jesus knew that his work from and the onset of his kingdom would bring a measure of distress, even to the point of cleaving families apart. He absolutely he wasn't particularly eager to have such mayhem happen, but what he clearly was eager about was to see the arrival of the kingdom itself. Jesus clearly expresses a deep desire to see the fire kindled because he knew better than anyone how badly the world needs this fire of renewal that God's kingdom represents. And if that new kingdom could come in no other way than to cause the conflict Jesus foresees, 
Well, then that's just the way it would have to be. The main thing was that the kingdom would come. C.S. Lewis once said that even Christian people sometimes think that being a follower of Jesus is like being a horse that gets trained to run a little bit faster than it used to run. But in reality, Jesus doesn't want a regular horse that can run more swiftly. What Jesus is really looking to do is give that horse wings and let it fly away. Jesus doesn't want to just move into the house of our hearts just to slap on a few coats of paint and change the draperies. No, when Jesus moves into our hearts, he brings a sledgehammer with him to tear down whole walls, gut the rooms down to the studs, and basically change things around so that it's a whole new house. But that level of change and renovation is hard. We want to baptize the various practices in our lives with a nice sprinkling of fresh water. The reality is that Jesus' spirit comes to us with a baptism of fire that burns up our lives and starts everything all over. When we resist this level of change and challenge, that's when Jesus has to talk tough to remind us that precisely because things are so thoroughly messed up in this world, we can't expect that everyone's going to want to go along with his program. Disagreements are going to arise. Those who remain enthralled with the way of life that's always been they're going to have sharp things to say to those who represent the sledgehammer of Jesus' kingdom. The difficulty of all this lies in the fact that as dramatic as these differences are, they don't always run nearly along solid black lines of demarcation that everyone can clearly see. Instead, the lines and the differences between the world's old ways of doing things and Jesus' way of doing things sort of zigzags through our lives. It's so overpowering that each of us sooner or later becomes adept at picking and choosing. We'll let Jesus have this part of our life, but not that part of our life. We'll let Jesus influence our decision-making at home, but not so much at work, where we are, after all, expected to kowtow to business as usual, or we can get fired. We'll let Jesus have our Sunday mornings, but not our Saturday nights. Picking and choosing like this makes life in modern society a lot easier. It reduces conflict. It helps everyone to get along better with everyone else. Wouldn't even Jesus want that kind of peace and serenity in our lives? Wouldn't he? Wouldn't he? And if the kingdom of God is intending to upend our lives and the very way the world typically operates, how does this apply to the family situation? Well, at a minimum, it applies to the priorities we set for our homes. Interestingly, the pace of the modern culture, the pace driven by precise people's desire to make a life for themselves, that may itself be at variance with the gospel. The busyness of our lives as we get more and more consumed by work, the end to make more money, the clutching desire to climb the corporate ladder, uh, that typically tends to edge out what we would call family time. During the pandemic, some folks have cut back on church in order, to, or rather, at this point, some people have cut back on church in order to clear out Sundays as their special family time. I think that we, as we emerge from the COVID bubble, many of us who have been, become accustomed to sitting at home and watching services online, rather than coming out to be part of the body of Christ in person, uh, we're going to hope that they're going to change their ways. Because faith is meant to be lived out as part of a community, not in isolation. And every part of the community needs to be in the game and needs to assist so that we can fulfill the entire mission of the church. The body of Christ needs all their parts to be an effective force in the 21st century. Many years ago, a man named Millard Fuller was pretty near at the top of the American success story. 
He was a high octane corporate executive working eight days a week and pulling down close to a million dollars a year. But then one day, he heard God calling to him, telling him that his life was over full and that his priorities were out of whack. So in prayer with his wife one day, Fuller recommitted his life to Christ. He quit his job, moved to a more modest house, and wondered what to do next. And then God answered his call. What he ended up doing next was building affordable houses for low-income families who could purchase these homes interest-free. Today, I'm sure all of us are aware of all the good Habitat for Humanity has done for this country and around the world. And now you know a little bit more about its founder. Our lives and what we prioritize define how we serve in the kingdom of God. Those priorities also show the world what we, as Christians, value most. These are the decisions we all make every day. And I know that at the end of more than just a few days, after I've looked back, I've failed to do some of the things that I should have done. But that doesn't mean that I don't try to do better the next. It's a choice we all have to make every day. And as I used to tell my kids and my grandkids when I put them on the bus to send them to school, I'd always say to them, make good decisions. Jesus is calling to us today and asking us to make good decisions. Amen. Now if we'll all join together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your church. We pray for all who dedicate our lives to serving your people. Renew our commitment to our siblings in faith around the globe, and bless the work of our ecumenical and interfaith partners, especially Peace and Zion UCC Church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your creation. We pray for all places affected by natural disasters, especially the floods in Kentucky. Transform the devastation of floods and fires into fertile ground for new life and growth. Fill heaven and earth with your life-giving spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain the nations. We pray for all elected officials. Kindle in them a desire to administer your justice. Strengthen their resolve to defend those who are vulnerable and to stand publicly against all forms of oppression. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain those who are oppressed. We pray for people harmed by racist discrimination, ableist discrimination, and all people discriminated against based on their gender identity or sexual orientation. Rescue us from all systems that degrade our fellow human beings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain this assembly. We pray for this community, celebrating with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. We pray for all on St. Luke's prayer list and we keep the call committee in our hearts. In our joy and in our tears, be near with us, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we remember the saints, especially Maximilian Kolb, who have gone before us. May we run with perseverance the race set before us until we find our rest in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. And now we will have special music. I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. I believe he paid for us all. I believe he is here now. Standing in our midst. Here with the power to heal now. And the grace to forgive. I believe in you, Lord. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again. I believe you paid for us all. And I believe you are here now. Standing in our midst. Here with the power to heal now. And the grace to forgive. I believe in you, Lord. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again. I believe you paid for us all. And I believe you are here now. Standing in our midst. Here with the power to heal now. And the grace to forgive. And the grace to forgive. Before we pray our offering prayer, I'd just like to thank everyone who keeps sending in their tithes and offerings to help sustain the work of St. Luke's here in Oblisk. So your, your offerings are much appreciated. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life, this day and always. Amen.
Go in peace. Love your neighbor. Thanks be to God.